Hi. So in the U.S., we recently had a vice presidential debate between Kamala Harris from California and Mike Pence from Indiana. And it was basically a tie. Uh, Mike Pence followed the polls, which are currently stating that most of the world is anti-China or sees China in a less than favorable light. And in, rather than spend time attacking Kamala's home state, uh, decided to spend time attacking a foreign country. Uh, that tactic was misguided simply because most people I don't think necessarily, especially during a time of COVID, of a pandemic, they're not, they're not as concerned about a foreign country as they are about domestic politics. And so what he should have done is just point out that Kamala comes from a state that has a 20% poverty rate, failing education systems, and essentially an entire system that is only manageable based on massive debt as well as massive fund, unfunded liabilities in the pension system. And therefore, this is not something that can be transmitted or transferred to the rest of the country. And furthermore, given her legal background, uh, her record as a prosecutor was already vetted by, you know, by Tulsi Gabbard in the Democratic debates, so we don't have to go there. In, in, in any sort of deep analysis. But quite frankly, the, the California is attempting to copy the EU and therefore give a foreign power a say in domestic politics. Had he said that, it would not have been a tie. But he's a little bit, oh, well, let's back up. You know, it, it is a problem that he's, you know, trying to come after a foreign power that when we're having so many domestic issues and therefore seek to displace blame externally. That's a, that's a problem. But the fact of the matter is Pence is a decent man. There's been no allegations of misconduct in his life. No allegations of cheating on his wife, no allegations of alcoholism, um, no allegations of really anything. There's been some issues where, as a young man, he procured kegs of alcohol for a fraternity. But tellingly, there's been no evidence that he actually partook in the kind of conduct that's, that these fraternities are known for, you know, namely just wild, you know, drunken parties. Um, and, you, and, and that's, not, that's, not, that's not nothing. You know, and rather, if you wanted to have a, a slogan that said, you know, make America decent again, uh, Mike Pence might be in the top five in terms of politicians that could, you know, that would personify uh, such an outlook. But I wanted to segue into a broader issue. And that broader issue is, you know, just, just the fact of, uh, maybe, maybe we, can, we can call it gender relations. Now, what Mike Pence, when I say decent, what is interesting is that Mike Pence is not necessarily somebody you would want to sit down with and have a, have a soda or a pop with because his life experiences are obviously a bit limited. And it comes across, and it came across in that debate. Um, now I'm not suggesting that his opponent is necessarily any more fun or enlightening to uh, sit down with. But the point that I'm trying to make is that in the high, it's quite obvious that he's not necessarily a creative person, even though he's smart. So, or original. So why is that? Now, if you look at most of the creative types all over the world, in almost every case, they come from somewhere else. Uh, and they've traveled at a young age, or they've suffered some sort of adversity, adversity at, a, at a young age, even if it means changing schools and so on. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the actors that we think are American are actually from Europe. Uh, Audrey Hepburn is an obvious example. Um, you know, Marilyn Monroe is American, but she's actually deaf in one year, and she was put into a foster home. I certainly had a, a difficult life, life growing up. Uh, you, you Cary Grant, um, you know, you, you just go back and look at all these people that you consider to be at the top of the heap in terms of creativity. You know, not only are many of them from overseas, but quite frankly, the other part that people tend to forget is that a lot of them are uh, gays or homosexuals or whatever term is acceptable these days. Um, LB, there's a, 
an acronym that I can never quite get right. Um, and so that's what I want to focus on is the, the creative aspect. Why is it so hard to have both decency and creativity? And quite frankly, the, the it should be obvious, you know, if, if you create a situation where you stay in one place and you get married, you raise children, you pay your mortgage and so on, you're not gonna be in a position where you're going to have a lot of life experience simply because it's just too difficult and it's too expensive. And so to the extent that you have that life experience, it's going to come from a position of, of privilege and wealth, which in and of itself blocks you from having the kind of experiences that would put you on par uh, with somebody who does not have or well, come from that sort of elite background. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see too many elites, whether they're children of elites or elites themselves, having much to say that's original. And we know that because the greatest speaker in America is probably Malcolm X, who went to jail, who was a pimp, who paid off police officers, um, and so on. So, you know, you've got that. You've got Muhammad Ali, also no college degree. Uh, again, somebody that was managed to outperform the Rand Institute and all of its PhDs on the issue of the Vietnam War. So you see right off the bat that being part of the establishment inhibits you in some way. And, 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 and in some very important ways. Specifically, being able to, being able to be original and, and to think for yourself. And the, the issue with gender relations is that if you wanted to create a hierarchy of creativity, you would probably put gay men at the top, and then at the very bottom would be uh, just women, whether straight or gay. And we, I wanted to analyze that. Now, some people say that that's the case because, you know, there just hasn't been enough finance, enough opportunities uh, for women, and that that's probably true. But again, it really goes back to the fact that if you're doing the hard work of sustaining civilization, staying in one place, buying a home, raising children, um, taking care of them, making doctor's appointments, cooking, so on. What, what that really says is that you don't necessarily have the time to put on a backpack and, and go to Europe for a year. And so when we talk about decency, we're talking about a, a scenario where we live in a world where creativity is not necessary for survival. It's a, it's a nice to have, it's an important to have, but it's not necessary for survival. You can imagine very easily a world where we have no art or very minimal art. And quite frankly, the kind of art that we've been coming up with over the last four years in the US is forgettable. And so it's a good example that you can survive in an environment where you do not necessarily foster creativity. So once you figure out that civilization requires not necessarily creativity, but a lot of other things that are more prosaic, you can see why that hierarchy has existed thus far. Now, whether or not that continues in developed countries as machines take over or hopefully take over a lot of the mundane tasks, I don't know. We've been talking about machines taking over mundane tasks and freeing up time for individuals for the last 50 years. And what's, what's happened is that the security flaws within these technological quote unquote improvements have been so severe that they've actually cost people a lot of time. Whether, you know, especially when you think about Wi-Fi and, and you know, the different SIMs, different networks, and a multitude of options, all of which may have their own way of doing things. And so this idea of technology necessarily leading to free time, which then opens up creativity, has been talked about for at least 50 years by almost everyone from Nobel Prize winners all the way down to, of course, your individual housewife in the 1950s, uh, who, was who was supposed to have more time with the invention of all sorts of things like the dishwasher and the vacuum cleaner and so on, um, even the microwave dinner. So when you look at that hierarchy, I wanna take, an, wanna take a moment to examine the why Mike Pence, where he comes from, because a lot of people are gonna look back on this and say, you know, not only, you know, why didn't he focus more, you know, <laughs> on the debate? Because it's quite, fr quite frankly, it's going to, you know, they're going to lose uh, this election and it's going to be 
Biden to win. It's not because he's any better, but if you actually look at the um, uh, the amount of, amount of money that's being spent, the Democrats in this election, because of a billionaire named Michael Bloomberg from New York, are actually outspending Donald Trump's campaign, uh, I think by a factor, yeah, by 100% by more money, is what I think. You can go on, I think it's the FEC, Federal Election Something Commission, and they actually publicize, you know, exactly who's spending what. And while Biden and Trump appear to be equal in terms of donations and spending, what's happened is that a former Republican, now Democrat, uh, Mike Bloomberg, has put his billion, about a billion dollars, maybe more, uh, into the campaign for Biden. And so essentially we have in the U.S. a situation where a billionaire bought the election in 2016, and now another billionaire is going to buy, from New York as well, it's going to buy the election in 2020. And again, that's not my, my, my main point of this, is to go back and try to explain, because I'm always for the underdog and, and the misunderstood. That's really my only consistent philosophy. Is that when you look about, when you think about Pence and where he comes from, you have to understand that he comes from that scenario where, you know, you want to flip that script. And if you think about what makes civilization run, if you think about it in the sense that you don't need art and creativity, that hierarchy that I talked about gets flipped. And women, especially mothers, get put at the top. And for creative types, get put at the very bottom. So when Mike Pence talks about things like abortion and, you know, comes across as somebody who doesn't want to regulate anything except the, a mother's womb, it's a, a situation where you can see that he's trying to flip that hierarchy and create a world, a civilization that is sustainable. Now, once you look at it that way, you can see why he's a decent person and you can see why he's sincere. Now, it's very important to understand that in order for us to move away from, you know, the fakeness of the left and the, and the perhaps misguided decency on the right, you have to come up with a, a something in between that, that, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily flip the current script, but that gives people all kinds of opportunities to maximize their potential. Schools were supposed to do that. They've obviously failed. The more schooling you have, uh, it seems like the less capable you are of creativity. And that's whether you go to a private school or a public school. And then I've met many people here who've gone to both. It's extremely difficult to have a, to go to any kind of school and obtain creativity because so much of it is, is based on what you do in, in your daily life and what you're exposed to. You know, does somebody give you a beautiful chest set when you're, you know, eight years old? If you're Bill Gates, does your father give you a computer, state-of-the-art, uh, when you're a teenager? And again, the idea of schools was that we were supposed to create a situation where, you know, those opportunities were not limited to uh, the children of lawyers, of corporate lawyers, like Bill Gates. But what's really happened is that, like I said, with technology becoming more mainstream, what's actually happened is that the technology itself is no longer a conduit for something useful. And part of that is, of course, the, the mobile phone's uh, ability to suck attention spans uh, and minimize attention spans over time. But of course, the other part of that is, you know, creativity is something that has to be nurtured. Um, and we haven't quite figured out how to do that. Everyone's trying to figure out how to do that. Nobody's figured out how to do that yet. So in order to first figure out why someone like Mike Pence um, has appeal, we have to understand again where he's coming from. And once you understand where he's coming from, then you have to realize that it's possible to have a world where sustainability and survival of the species are compatible with the opportunity for everyone to maximize their creative potential.